they let me show me how that go. Okay. <laughs> Again. I'm looking forward to talking with you all this afternoon. Thank you, for the <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. I feel very excited and honored that I can share my research with you here today. My research is toward an integration of learning and iterative control algorithms. Specifically, I want to integrate learning and control to teach robot motor skills. Here's a video of robot dancing. Here's a video of human dancing. For all advances in robotics, we still need to hard code those movements to make robot dance. And those robots still cannot dance like human dancers. Can we teach robots to dance like a human dancer? I don't know how to dance like that either, but I know how to learn to dance. We start with learning the basic movements. I'm taking ballet classes right now, and my teacher corrects my positions again and again. My favorite teacher not only corrects my positions, but also tells us which muscle should be firing, and how to feel if that muscle is firing or not. If I push myself too hard by using the wrong muscle to reach those positions, I am hurting myself instead of learning to dance. After I learn the anatomy, after I know the model of my own body, I can gradually build my muscle strings to reach those positions instead of hurting myself. Can we apply similar strategies to robot? Answer is we can, and we can use iterative learning control. What is iterative learning control? Iterative learning control learn by repetitions in practice to track a desired finite time trajectory with high accuracies. There are four key points here. First, ILC solves trajectory tracking problems. That means this desired trajectory is given at the beginning, is predefined, just like those basic movements in dance. Second, ILC is offline learning. Control commands are computed between iterations. And third, ILC uses data in the real world to compensate for model inaccuracies. And therefore, ILC aims to approach 
the reproducibility level of the hardware beyond the model accuracy. Researchers have applied ILC onto surgical robots, quadrocopters, and vehicles. However, I think there's a lot more that ILC can do, for example, for software robots, because ILC is offline learning and ILC does not require an accurate model. Why does ILC not require an accurate model? Let's take a look at the equations. Here's the linear dynamics, the state-based model, and we have control input, the actions as UK, and the output are the YK. If we want to follow a finite time desired trajectory YD, which has P time steps, we could write control commands and the system outputs of the entire trajectory for the iteration J as UJ and YJ. The relationship between the commands and the outputs for the entire trajectory is yj equals p, which is a topless matrix, times uj, the commands of the entire trajectory, plus o is the observability matrix, times xj0, the initial state. What is the p? p is the topless matrix made of Markov parameters. The system Markov parameters are the CB, CAB, and CA squared B. After we know the relationship between YJ and UJ, we can establish an ILC learning law. UJ, the control commands for the current iteration equals to UJ minus one, the control commands from the previous iteration, plus L, which is the learning matrix that we are going to design times E j minus one, the tracking error from the previous iteration that we measured. Suppose we have the same initial conditions for all iterations. The error propagation across iterations becomes E j, the tracking error of the current iteration, equals to I, the identity matrix, minus P, the top this matrix of the system, times L the learning law we are going to design, times ej minus one, the tracking error from the previous iteration. If all the singular values of i minus pl are smaller than one, this becomes a contraction mapping. That means the tracking error can be decreased monotonically across iterations during learning. And we do not need an accurate model to design or to establish this contraction mapping law. That's why we do not need an accurate model in ILC. And when we have the error decreases monotonically, that means we are learning safely and efficiently. This is why ILC doesn't require the accurate model. And here's the summary of the basic concepts of ILC. To follow a predefined trajectory, ILC learns from data in the real world and adapts the control commands. By establishing a contraction mapping based on a not accurate model, we can make the learning process safely and efficiently. To demonstrate this concept, I implemented ILC for the point mass in the Mojoko robot. It's a very simple example to follow a eight, to follow a figure eight trajectory. And the simulated robot represents the real dynamics, which has a friction and a point set equals to 0 0.012. The model I used in ILC doesn't have a friction and have a wrong point set. I use random commands for the initial iteration and plot the RMS error of each iteration during learning. After eight iterations, it converges. Let's take a look of the trajectory. This is the random initial action. And then it starts learning the figure eight trajectory. Iteration five, six, 
seven and that this is just to demonstrate and show you the basic concept of ILC. In real life, we have <coughs> more complicated situations. For example, in real life, we need to deal with parasitic vibration modes. What is a parasitic vibration mode? This is a vibration testing plate. It has a vibration mode at 345 hertz and it has more vibration modes at higher frequencies. If our model does not include those higher frequency vibration modes, those vibration modes, the named parasitic vibration modes. Can ILC deal with these parasitic vibration modes? Here is the simulation. If we have a spring mass damper system, we use a second order trans function to represent the dynamics. The real dynamics, however, might have a high frequency pole that we don't know. What will happen for this case if we apply ILC using a second order system model? Here's what happens. When we use a model without the high frequency pole, the tracking error are decreased at the first few iterations. Those are the errors related to the low frequency dynamics. But the high frequency dynamics will give us errors that will be accumulated across iterations during learning. And those errors will show up and increase in the end. That means our ILC doesn't work anymore in this case. How can we deal with this situation? An easy way is to sit there, watch the robot learning, and stop the learning once the error just increases. And this doesn't sound a good solution. Also, when it is nonlinear dynamics, we will see the temporary increase of the tracking error, but the tracking error will decrease again. In that case, it doesn't make any sense for us to stop the learning. A better solution could be use a filter as traditional control would do for parasitic poles. So we could use a filter to stop the accumulation of errors related to the high frequency dynamics. But the question is, Will this filter destroy the contraction mapping that we've already established? And luckily, the traditional filters will do. If I want to follow the desired trajectory smoothly from zero to one, after 200 iterations, to, with a traditional field, field filter, which is a surface cutoff filter from MATLAB, we will get a trajectory that reaches almost 20 in the end. It has exploded. Why does this happen? Why the traditional zero-phase filters can destabilize an otherwise stable ILC law? This is because of a mismatch between the frequency-based filter design and its finite time implementation. What does this mean? Suppose we are going to design a Butterworth filter and we have the transfer function, we choose the cutoff frequency, we choose the order. In the end, the transfer function, the frequency response in the Z domain is denoted by HZ and can be written like this. We will see the HZ later. This is the frequency response we want at the beginning for this filter. And now we implement it in ILC and filter a finite time trajectory. We, this is similar to how we write the top list P matrix for the system earlier. We can write a F matrix, which is also the <coughs> top list matrix, to represent the filtering process. UJ is the original commands and UJC is the commands after filtered for the entire trajectory. 
if we do the discrete Fourier transform of the finite time implemented filter, we could see the frequency response. It has HZ inside of it, only with a small mismatch that is a coupling between different frequencies. And this, I think I need a bit help. Okay, we are back. We have the coupling between each frequencies. That's where the tracking error accumulated. <coughs> How can we deal with this? We need to get rid of this mismatch. We could fill in the zeros and make this F matrix circulant. If we take the DFT of this circulant filter, we get exactly the HZ we designed at the very beginning. By using this circulant filter in ILC, we could learn the trajectory that we couldn't when we use the zero phase field field in MATLAB. Takeaways. The circulant zero phase filter for ILC is a non-causal filter. It can be used for offline learning. And there's a relationship between the field frequency response, the topless matrix of the system, and also the circulant matrix made of the system markup parameters. And when I first discovered this relationship between these three terms, and I realized I can come up with the idea to make a circulant filter used in ILC, I thought I made a huge contribution to this field. Then I just Googled circulant filter. I actually found circulant filter has existed for a long time but not in control, probably not in robotics, but in image processing. I think that's because we need offline learning for the circulant filter, it is non-causal. But that's the time that I realized the, probably the problems or the solutions to our research problems might already been there, existed for a long time, but in a different field. Okay, come back to the topic of ILC. Now we can use a filter to stop the accumulation of tracking errors. But at the same time, this filter stops the learning above its cutoff frequency. That means the best tracking accuracy is limited. For this example, if we use control rate 20 hertz, the best tracking accuracy will be one e to the minus three. If we use a control rate of 40 hertz, the best tracking rate will be one e to the minus four. The higher the control rate, the lower the tracking accuracy can be achieved, but a higher control rate can speed up the hardware. So what can we do if we want high tracking accuracy at high speed? We don't want to go into using the high, track, uh, the high control rate directly because it's dangerous. We might have parasitic pulse. Then we can gradually increase the control rate and up the models during learning. <coughs> the problem is that if we want to update the state space model A, B, C, and D, we need a lot of data. How can we do that when we want to update the model during learning, when we only have a few iterations? The answer is that we could recover the Markov parameters instead of A, B, C, and D from commands and sensor data. If we have a state space model that we don't know what A, B, C, and D exactly is, we can write an n-step model and if there exists an app that can cancel this guy, we could write the ARX model, which is only in terms of commands and sensor data. Then we can use least square solutions to recover the parameters in the ARX model. Then we can use the relationship between these parameters to recover the marker parameters of the original system. And I did a simulation to sh 
show that how the ILC will work when we increase the control rate from 20 hertz to 40 hertz. We'll keep updating the model by using this adaptive ILC method. I can keep the tracking error below 10 to the minus 2, which is the best tracking accuracy that 40 hertz can achieve. Here's the takeaway of this adaptive ILC with the dead bit observer. M in the previous equation is the dead bit observer. We can borrow knowledge from linear system identification into ILC to update learning, to update the models during learning, and the richness, da richness of data determines the convergence. So until now, all the equations are used linear dynamics but we always have nonlinear dynamics in the real world. Can we transfer our knowledge from linear dynamics to nonlinear dynamics? For system identification, I'm not sure, but I guess no, or maybe some professors have different opinions, but for control, I know the answer is yes, because we can use locally linearized model. There exists a close vicinity that the locally linearized model can represent the nonlinear dynamics, and as long as we limit our learning step size inside of this close vicinity, ILC will work. That's the linearization based ILC. I implemented it for a snake like robot to demonstrate the idea of linearization based ILC. The purple snake is from the first, in, uh, first iteration, which I still use in use random commands. Okay, please. Uh, if, if, you're, um, if, you're, if you have perfect control of your initial conditions, then this uh, might work. But uh, if you have even small variations in the initial conditions at the different runs, you'll have completely different linearized dynamics, right? And so <coughs> you must be assuming that you can very, very carefully control initial This is a big branch in the ILC field. To come up with the methods that deal with variations in the initial conditions, I don't have specific publications that work in this line, but what I know is that what they do is to release the tracking, the requirement of the tracking accuracy at the first few time steps. Like, we start a point here, we want to go down right away. And at time step one, we hope it just go down for 0 0.5 millimeters. But if we start not from zero, we start from 0 0.1, we can ask the next point to be at between 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 instead asking it go to 0 0.5. And after we released the first few steps, we could still keep tracking the future, the steps like after maybe t, of t equals to five. Am I clear? Like there are methods to kind of get rid or wiggling around from that requirement. That is the limitation of ILC, but not a very tight limitation. Am I clear or not? Maybe we'll pick it up on. If, if you had an unstable point, then that, that would be how you, that idea won't work at all. But I'll, let's, I'll let's you mean unstable? Oh, okay. There's another assumption that I didn't talk about it. ILC only deals with feed forward signals. So that means we already suppose the plant is stable. We already put feedback controller inside of the plant. And then we just modify the feed forward signals. So the initial condition wouldn't be stabilizing. Is it? Or I'm talking a different <laughs> topic, or I don't understand. We, we talk about that. Okay. 
I'd like to know more about uh, your question. So go back to the linearization based LC. The initial, the gates from the initial trajectory is in the purple and the yellow snake denote, the yellow snake represents the gate after it's learned. And we can see that it takes almost to more than 200 iterations to converge. That's because we need to limit the learning step size. And we have temporary increase in the tracking error. That is because we step out of this close vicinity temporarily. What if we know more about the dynamics? What if we know the nonlinear dynamics? Can we do better than this? What if we trust our model of the nonlinear dynamics? Can we use the knowledge of nonlinear dynamics in ILC? Suppose we know the nonlinear model. We could do Kahneman bilinearization for this model. Basically, Kahneman bilinearization use a new state that is made of the components from the Taylor series. For example, if the original state x t has three components and we can write the new state as delta x1, delta x1 square, delta x1, delta x2, delta x1, delta x3, we can write as many as possible. And the higher the dimensionality is, the more accurate this model can represent the nonlinear dynamics. After discretization, we get a bilinear model that we can use in ILC. However, we use this bilinearized model means we cannot establish the contraction mapping anymore. Instead of contraction mapping, I use the fixed point iteration to design the ILC law. Another method is to use the feedback linearization. Feedback linearization also use a new state that's made of Lie derivatives. The key idea of feedback linearization is that the nonlinear dynamics is included <coughs> in the new commands. BK is the command to this feedback linearizable system. And we have the nonlinear dynamics inside of BK. Then we can use linearization based, we can use linear ILC on this feedback linearization, feedback linearized model. So when we compare these three methods for ILC, if we have more information from our model, we could come up with better ILC algorithms and make it learning faster. Generally speaking, a linearization based ILC plus a circulant future will be the implementation in the practice for general system. Depends on how much information we have for this nonlinear dynamics at the beginning. We could choose different ILC algorithms. Now we can use ILC to learn a predefined trajectory, to learn some basic movements. The question is, who defined those basic movements? For the basic movements from ballet, it was defined by the French court and it represented their aesthetic taste. What about other basic movements for other motor skills. For example, how about the gates for locomotion? Who defined those gates? The human and nature define those gates. And if I assume the nature select those basic movements according to some functions, some cost functions, then it is possible for us to use optimal control to generate those basic movements automatically. 
For example, we can use model predictive control. What is model predictive control? Suppose I want to go to the corner of that room and I only have an eyesight of two meters. I will take a look at these two meters and take one step. And then I will take a look at another two meters and see, oh, there's a table, but it's better I don't go into this way. I will plan a next step. I keep repeating this process until I reach my goal. This is the general idea of model predictive control. For the equations at t equals to zero, we solve an optimization problem over a horizon of n plus one time steps. And for the next time step, we solve another optimization problem. And we can use iterative learning quadratic regulator to solve the optimization problems for nonlinear dynamics. To test my hypothesis that we can use MPC to automatically generate basic movements, I implemented MPC with ILQR for snake-like robots in the simulation. I choose this snake-like robot because it's high dimensional, it's, it's non-holonomic, so it's very difficult for control. But at the same time, the snake has high mobility and dexterity. That means it's a good test bed to find if we have basic movements for different tasks. And also it has very great practical application in the future as we could use snake robot for rescue and search, go across cluttered terrain, go across buried buildings, something like that. Traditional gate generation uses compliant controller and serpentoid curves, which is a predefined movement pattern. Can we automatically generate snake-like gates like the snake itself does? The snake only knows it wants to go to a goal, but it doesn't know the serpentoid curve in his mind. Here are the results. I generated gates across different environments, but using the same cost function in MPC and the same parameters, same cost functions in ILQR. I tried three different environments. The first is the Coulomb friction, and the second is the anisotropic viscous friction. The third is the fluid dynamics. We can create efficient gates across all these three environments using the same cost functions. Qualitatively, these gates are comparable to the parent optimal gates that's generated by a compliant controller plus the predefined serpentine curve. And qualitatively, I can find its biological counterparts this is a snake moving on a surface which is similar to the snake with coulomb friction. This is a ribbon eel. And oops. We can look at the curves are bigger than whatever in the dry friction environment. The most obvious one is in the fluid dynamics versus salmon. The tail is the key part to propel the body. The head doesn't move that much. So we can use MPC to generate those basic movements. And we don't need to change the cost functions. We just need to tell the robot, hey, it has a goal. Can we do more? If we manipulate the cost function, we could avoid obstacles.
the gates between the obstacles are much smaller than the gates when we are away from those obstacles. And if we manipulate the position of the goal, now we have a goal on the left hand side of the snake, we can make sharp turns. For this work, we demonstrate that MPC can automatically generate snake gates across different environments without predefined movement patterns and without hand tuning parameters. And the resulting gates are quantitatively comparable to their sophenoid counterparts. If I keep going with my assumption, if I want to discover the basic movements for a type of tasks, I can use MPC in simulations with human intelligence to design the cost functions and the environment for the tasks. After I get enough data, I can use clustering or regression, whatever from machine learning that could be useful and could be applied in this case then I can discover those basic movements. Now here's the pipeline of my future work or my plan of my work. So we can use optimal control or example-based planning or reinforcement learning to generate basic movements in simulations we could apply iterative learning control on individual robots to learn those basic movements. And then if we figure out how to form the muscle memory and how to synthesize complex behaviors from those basic movements, after that we could name those basic movements with abstract concept. And after a lot of work and lots of cooperation, I guess, through different fields, we could teach robots to learn dance like human dancers do. That we only need to tell the human dancers, hey, what should be the emotions at this tempo and what would be the movement looks like and the dancers can get it right away. We don't need to hard code those movements in the robots anymore. The underlying guidance principle for my work is that I want to use control as long as there is a model, as long as there is some control that we can use. And we use this control to guide the learning. When we need learning, we introduce learning into control to provide information to control. We could use learning from data in the practice to get the information of what the real model is. We can use data in the simulations to pre-train a neural network that would estimate what the future would look like in the real world. And when we use control, we need to guide the learning that could keep it in the safety and efficiency zone. That's the line of work similarly to the guided policy search, the MPC net, that using controller, using a control algorithm to create data and use the data to train the neural network, then apply the neural network as a controller to the real world. If taking one step back to an even higher level. What 
I want to do is that we have some mathematical formulation that describe the real world problems and we can have the solution in most cases in control theory or numerical methods to find the solution, to compute the solution in the computer and that will be the real solution to this mathematical formulation <coughs> of this real world problem. But there's the model inaccuracies in our mathematical formulation and that's the part when we use empirical experience, we use the data, we use learning to provide information and correct whatever is wrong or whatever is a little bit off in our mathematical formulation. Other than those motor skills I talked about, I also did some projects for the manipulation by learning from teleoperation. This is the work based on my lab mates that already designed the teleop mapping between hands and this room hand. There's a person teleoperating of this video trying to turn the valve and pick it up. But the trajectory given by teleoperation is not perfect for this <coughs> robot hand. It's imperfect in so many different ways. In the algorithm, we could improve it. Also, human hand has five fingers, we have three fingers. How to map it, how to compensate for that. I'm trying to optimize those trajectories by learning from the teleoperation right now. And also, I'm interested if we can apply LC for rehabilitation robots because the gates are generate the gates itself is periodic and ILC could be applied on it and I also want to use ILC for social robots to reconstruct the facial expressions and make it less creepy maybe go beyond the uncanny valley if it's possible and also maybe some aesthetic design for the pet robots. So I am early, that's the end, we can have questions. The traditional one, the traditional ILC used data in the real world that correct the feedforward signal. It's very straightforward and simple concept. We went through, we go through a trajectory, we measure the error and we correct the error for the next iteration. There are different ways to make sure that we could go beyond the model accuracy that we use. If we just simply use like a gradient descent method to correct the error, the error will decrease for at first iteration, then it will increase dramatically. In one simulation, the error will increase to the 10 to the power like 50. So that's why we have this ILC. This is just the general basic learning part. Picking. Another part about learning is to get the data from the real world, then update the models, which basically what I did is for the linear systems to make the adaptive ILC. And this is for the ILC part. For the 
MTC part and IOQR part, we could use learning to give a better initial trajectory <coughs> in IOQR. And then we could decrease the computation time. So basically my work is that if we have a model we have control, we try to get our best performance. And when it is necessary, we could use learning. And for the future work, I will touch with those unexpected situations and unstructured environments. That will be the case that I use controller as a guidance. This follows the research direction that we use controller in the simulation to get data and then use those data to train a neural network. That's the part that neural network has to see. And I don't have good results for that pipeline yet. What I'm thinking is that right now it's very simple and easy. We can get design the cost function just like learning or get the idea from the biological creators. But if that doesn't work, we need to apply inward optimal control, inward reinforcement learning. We need to get data in simulations just creating different situations trying different ways like use sampling, sampling based planning to plan all the trajectories and compute different cost functions in different forms and then see if there is any cost function that denotes those basic movements. The first start algorithm I would use is inverse optimal, uh, optimal control but I feel that we might use some other methods, just collect a lot of data by random sampling, and then try to get some insights from those samples. Yep. So I don't see sounds like you're basically Yes. When you're actually implementing this on a robot, what sort of controllers are you adding to handle disturbances and noise? If the disturbances is repeated, LC itself can already handle it. And to stable the system, like what uh, that gentleman asked before, there is an assumption that I didn't say at the beginning. We suppose there's another controller already embedded in the system. We might have PID controller, we might have optimal controller already there. ILC is on the very top of all these controllers just to modify and adapt the feedforward signal, like the last step. to have some feedback from those I think
Just one minute. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs>